So uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for offering to do a talk to the nature group. We're always uh, very pleased when somebody comes forward. So Trevor comes from Southport. Uh, he's a very long term member of the nature group and has supported the group very well in the past. He, he has done field trips to the Sefton coast, which were very popular uh, with participants uh, being treated to a very wide range of uh, flowers and insects. And I'm sure he will explain um, the difficulties of that now. Uh, but uh, we're hoping that uh, he, we might persuade him to run us something in that area. Um, I don't think I'm going to say a lot more other than I've already had a bit of a preview of some of his pictures. I'm sure we're in for a, a real treat. So uh, I think over to you, Trevor. All right. Thank you very much, Anne. Hello, everyone. What we're going to do now is the difficult bit. I'm going to share my screen and hope, sometimes above hope, that it all works out all right. There we are. I'm hoping now that you can see my introductory slide. Still use the old term slide, don't we, from time to time. Photographing insects. Duncan and Anne, is that all right? Is it yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, so we're in good shape, yes? We yeah. are. Excellent. Yeah, well, hello everyone and, and good afternoon. Thanks very much for, for being with us. Um, just before we go into this particular uh, photographing insects, um, Anne did mention that I, I live on the, uh, on the west coast here. I live about 10 miles north of Liverpool. My home is uh, just a few, perhaps half a mile from the sea. And I'm very fortunate, really, because I live in an area of the largest sand dune complex in England, uh, known as the Sefton Coast, which is, it, it, it stretches approximately 21 kilometers from north to south, starting down at Bootle and ending up on the River Ribble. Um, we're, we're on the Irish Sea, really. And it's a wonderful place. I'm very fortunate to live here. It's a, it's a huge sand dune complex. But it's not just sand dunes, it's uh, a mixture of hollows which hold water, we call them slacks, uh, wet meadows, pine woods, forests, and a number of other things. It's a, it's a delightful place. Um, and it's very, very good. As Anne said, I've led tours in the past, particularly in June, early June for orchids, bee orchids, northern and southern marsh orchids and so on. Uh, and, and quite a lot of insects. We, we are well favoured with insects and you'll see one or two of them in the talk. Um, we'll make a start if we can. This particular one, photographing insects, is one of our sand dune specialists, um, the red banded sand wasp. Uh, it's an insect that's the female we're looking at here on, on a thistle. It's an insect up to 25 millimetres long, so it's, it's quite an impressive beast actually. Latin name Amophila subulosa, wonderful thing, but not if you're another insect, uh, particularly if you're in the caterpillar stage. These are uh, parasitic wasps, quite common here on the coast. Um, what they do, they catch a small caterpillar, they take it back to the, a hole that they've dug for a nest, they lay an egg upon it, uh, the egg hatches, and then it eats the caterpillar. The caterpillar is stung, and so it's still alive, but immobile, uh, and ultimately the um, the wasp pupates and then comes out again when it's when it's fully grown. The thing about these insects, uh, the, one of the remarkable things about them is that they are um, brood parasites, and it's known that they like cuckoos. They they do go into other other wasps' nests and they steal the food, or on occasion they throw the existing egg away. Uh, and they lay, they lay one of their own on, it's rather like a cuckoo does. So they're quite fascinating things. And somebody once asked me if they stung. Uh, and I said, I don't know, because I never picked one up. Uh, they're rather fierce, actually. But anyway, that's, that's by way of an introduction. Let's have a look at the science bit. Insects represent about 90% of all animal life on Earth. Now, I think that is quite an incredible statement. But I think it's fairly accurate, really. Uh, insects, I mean, there are a lot of them. Uh, the next one says it's thought there could be over six million species. Well, 
I, I don't quite think that, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration because these days, scientifically, we've, we've covered a lot of bases and uh, we've still only really uh, got around about a million that are categorized. So we've still got a long way to go. And though some are serious pests, and we know many of the ones that are pests, you know, malarial and so forth, many are greatly beneficial as, as you'll all know, particularly things like honeybees and, and so many insects that do good in so many different ways. If we lost our insects, and I know we're living in an age of pretty much mass destruction of, of our insect life uh, on earth, not just here, but, but all over the world. If we lost insect life, uh, it would life would go on. I think it's fair to say it says insects are fundamental to life on Earth. But as uh, Bones on Star Trek said, and you may have heard him say it many times, it would be life, Jim, but not as we know it. So things would change quite dramatically. What is an insect? A ah, difficult question. It could take a long time to answer that one, but I think. You can, it's very, very safe to say, really, that at some stage in its life, an insect will have six legs. They are very, very varied creatures uh, with so many different forms and so on. Now, some of you may say, well, yes, I, but I've seen a lot of butterflies, uh, butterflies like Red Admirals in the Nymphalidae, that only have four legs. And that to a degree is, is true, except they do have six legs, but two of them, the front ones, are very diminished. Uh, they call them the brush-footed insects, and some people believe they use those front legs as a sensory organ. Well, that has still to be proved, I think. But it is true to say that at some stage in its life, most insects, in fact, I think almost all insects, will have six legs. Now, if you are an arachnophobe, uh, I'll take that back. Look away now for the next minute or so, because I'm going to show you a couple of things that aren't insects. And the reason I'm doing this is that, to my great surprise, I, I, was, I was watching a, a nature competition being judged a couple of years ago now. And uh, the judge, God bless his soul, the judge said uh, when a spider came up, it was an orb web spider, you know, the kind that we get in our gardens most late summer and early autumn. Uh, and he, he said, I've never seen one of these insects before. And I thought, oh, my word. And it didn't get a great deal better after that. So just for the sake of clarity, spiders are not insects. Spiders are members of the Arachnidae, together with things like scorpions and ticks and mites. Um, and uh, the harvestmen, of course, they're spiders. They all have eight legs, well, most of them have eight legs. Uh, and they, they are, I like spiders, I know many people don't, I, I think spiders are quite wonderful. This one has got a lovely name of the splendid jumping spider. So anyway, spiders have eight legs, insects have six. Why would we photograph insects? Well, I suppose you can do it for many reasons. You can photograph insects as a record, and many of us moth trap, and we go out and we're part of recording groups to record insects and moths and things like that. And it's always nice to be able to have a backup of the record that you've made. Out in the field, you come across something and you could just put it down in your little notebook and say, I found one of these or one of those. Enter it onto a, a website or, or into a recording system. But it's always nice to have a, a photograph that can back up your record. Of course, you can do it for personal enjoyment, and I know many of us do. Um, it's, I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to go out into the field and look for insects and photograph them. There's a, a great deal of joy to be had, even though these days we don't have as many insects as I know generations ago they had. We've still got plenty out there that we can enjoy. And of course, you can photograph them for talks and presentations rather like this one. Or, if your work is, is good enough, you can enter them into exhibitions. Um, insects do reasonably well in exhibitions, natural history exhibitions, because it's thought by many that they're not that easy to photograph, and, and to a degree that's true. So if your work is good enough, enter them in exhibitions, because they, they have a good chance of doing quite well. 
But I suppose one of the main reasons is because they're beautiful. Now, one or two people may disagree with me on that statement because some insects don't look particularly pretty, but it's all uh, it's subjective, isn't it? It's all a matter of what you think is beautiful and what isn't. There are many reasons to photograph insects. And how do you photograph insects? Well, here we've got a canary shouldered thorn. It's a moth that thinks it's a butterfly uh, because it rests with its wings not quite closed. They are at an angle. But it looks like a butterfly. I like it. It's one of my favourite moths, the canary shouldered thorn. It's been very good to me over recent years. Uh, it's it's a, a moth that you get summertime and uh, you know early autumn. Beautiful, beautiful thing. And I'm always happy when I get one or two canary shouldered thorns in the trap. How do you do it? Well, let's have a look. You can do it with an inexpensive camera. You do not need to spend a lot of money. This little camera, I prepared this talk during last year, so it might be a little bit out of date, but we won't worry about that. This little camera you can buy for 40 pounds. And this camera used carefully will probably take pictures that are an improvement on some of the most expensive film cameras that were ever made. It's amazing. You can take pictures on this, put them onto your computer, uh, bring them out in Photoshop or another software, and you can find really, really beautiful pictures with a very inexpensive camera like this. Or you can go in the opposite direction and you can buy a really top notch, one of the latest uh, mirrorless cameras. This is the Canon. Uh, again, this might be more expensive now. But the body alone costs £4,300. And there are cameras, of course, that cost considerably more than that. But that's only for the body. If you want to buy a macro lens, and it's a good idea to have a macro lens for insects, you're going to have to pay for a, for a Canon F2.8. You're going to have to pay about £1,250 on top. So five and a half thousand quid will get you into the business. Um, and if it did, you would be using some of the best equipment. Now, I am not a Canon man. In fact, you'll hear a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but it doesn't really matter what the camera make is because they all take jolly good pictures if they use properly. Or you can use an iPhone or an Android phone. I was in the Liverpool store of Apple a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've got an iPhone 12, which I don't use a lot for taking pictures, although it does take good pictures. And one of the guys there said, have you had a look at this? It's the latest iPhone 14 Pro Max. It's fairly expensive, but it's got a macro lens on it. And I said, no, I'll have a look at it for you. And it, and it, it took some macro work. Well, I tell you, it was, it was absolutely astonishing what this camera can do, you know, with, with the, the inbuilt lens and the macro lens. And it just produced wonderful work. I know that in all probability, I wouldn't be able to make a really good A3 print from the resultant image. But when you consider what a phone was just a generation ago, uh, it's just a remarkable thing that you can carry in your pocket all the time. And with one of these, not, not the latest uh, iPhone 14 Pro Max, but with an Android, with you know any kind of mobile phone these days that's got camera, you can produce good work if you go about it properly. The main thing is, and I think this is probably the most important thing I'll say this evening. The main thing is get to know your camera. Now, that's that's an interesting point. I'm just going to have a swig of water and we'll come back to it in a second. <clears throat> yes, get to know your camera. <clears throat> Frog in the throat. Why, why do I put this on? Because you would think it's it's pretty fundamental, really, isn't it? You know, that if you've got a camera, you need to get to know how to use it. And you do. But these days, in my opinion, handbooks are not a great deal of good. Uh, you buy a camera. It doesn't matter if it's an expensive one, uh, Canon, Nikon, whatever, Sony. The handbook that comes with it doesn't really tell you a great deal about how to use it other than fundamental things. And for the kind of thing that you need for photographing insects or, or any other natural history thing, you really do need to know how your camera works. What happened to me recently that brought this home with a bang 
all my photographic life, I've been a Nikon person. And that's going back well over 40 years. I've always had Nikon gear and I've not got a problem with it. I've never had a problem with it. It served me beautifully. Optically, I think the lenses that I use, and I had a shed load of lenses, I really did with Nikon over the years. I never, I never sold any, I just kept them. Optically, particularly things like a 200 millimeter micro from Nikon, oh, so sweet, so beautiful. However, I'm getting older now, and I was finding that carrying, I was, I've got a D850 and carrying it around was becoming problematic. I, I wasn't able to carry it as far and as long as I used to be able to. And in addition to that, I was looking and, and learning a little bit about photo stacking. Now my D850 would photo stack, but in order for me to use the stack that I produced, I had to go into software. I could do it in Photoshop or one of the uh, stacking software like Zerine Stacker, one or two others. But that, that meant I'd got to come away from where I was working and, and get it on the, on the computer. Olympus bought out a camera that would photo stack in camera. And so, because that was a facility that I really wanted, I decided to buy one. This was a couple of years ago. And oh, ladies and gentlemen, it was a revelation. It really, really was. I bought this, it was not the latest Olympus, the OM1, which I haven't got, but I may think about getting one, but it was, uh, an Olympus OMD, uh, it, you know, it's a couple of generations ago that uh, to the to the latest Olympus. But I bought one, um, and immediately I realised that I was a bit foolish, because it was a lightweight camera. It was nice to handle, wasn't particularly expensive too, which was important. But my goodness me, was it complicated? Oh my word. I mean, I've been using Nikons for all these years, and, and I thought Nikons were fairly straightforward and generally easy to use. But the Olympus had got menus, it had got sub menus, it had got sub sub menus. Oh, it went on. The one, the camera that I bought, believe it or not, had 18 buttons, four dials, and two levers. And you could press those in different ways, so it did different things. And you know, I went to grammar school and yet I thought I was going, to, I thought I was stupid. So what I did, I bought a book. Mastering the Olympus OMD, EM1 Mark II, that was the model that I bought. Uh, I loved the weight of it and I loved the way it handled. It was, it was really good, but I had difficulty getting to understand it. This book had 615 pages and I couldn't understand any of it. And I read it and I tried to read it, but it didn't really help me. And so I found a resource that worked so beautifully for me. For, I'm going to recommend it to you all, YouTube. With YouTube, they've got Olympus ambassadors and, and other things that they call them. And I'm sure other camera manufacturers do the same. They've got YouTube that will explain to you everything you need to know. And they did this with Olympus. Uh, I went on. I wanted to know how to stack in camera. I was told how to stack in camera, step by step, do this, do that, do the other. Wanted to know how to do this, it told me. So this book, which cost me 25 quid, by the way, uh, I now use it as a doorstop. Um, but that's all that's by the by. So you've probably heard this statement many times before. It doesn't matter what camera gear you've got, whether it's the inexpensive one or the latest top of the line camera. You can have all the gear with no idea. And even if you have spent a lot of time and you can use your camera inside out and backwards. Something else really, I forgot to just in, to say then, with, with modern cameras, they can do so many things that if you want to do everything, if you wanna be a generalist, you're gonna to have to learn a lot. With the kind of things that we're talking about this evening, you really only need to learn the parts of the camera that are going to be useful to you. For example, I am never, as far as I know, ever going to use second curtain sync. But most cameras have got the ability to use second curtain sync and all the other things. So really, because this is complicated, concentrate on the things that they can do for you. Cameras 
are important. They're wonderful things, but you can take them out into the field and still not be able to take a decent picture. Here's some of the reasons why. Fieldcraft. When you're photographing insects, fieldcraft is critically important. You, you really need to understand your subject and how you can approach it. So fieldcraft, with all the things that you have to do, uh, is, is something that you need to do. Avoid sudden movements. Approach stealthily. Now, I'm quite sure that many of you out there have been on butterfly trips abroad or other field workshops and things like that. And somebody says, oh, look, there's a butterfly, a so-and-so. And everybody rushes forward. Well, of course, the butterfly flies away because it's, its instinct is to do that. If it feels something's coming at it and it sees it on the horizon or in the sky, it's going to fly away because that person or that thing could be a predator. So I, I go out a lot with a friend of mine who is a very fine naturalist and a really good person, knows a lot about insects. And what, whenever we come across something that we want to photograph and we see it, it we both got binoculars, the first three words he says are um, no sudden movements. And he repeats it to himself, no sudden movements. And it works. A gentle approach, a stealthy approach is really important. You will need to wear somber clothing. Uh, and that's important too, not camouflage. Uh, no, not camouflage. We, we're, not, we're not going to war. Uh, I, I'm, I don't really care much for camouflage, but something somber, something that isn't going to stand out uh, and, and alarm your subject. Avoid casting sudden shadows. That is important too, especially if the sun's out and you've got contrasty shadows. If you walk and you let your shadow cast upon an insect, uh, there's a likelihood that it's going to fly away because the shadow tells it that it is potentially going to be predated. Try not to disturb vegetation. Now, I like to work from a tripod, so that is quite difficult for me not to disturb vegetation. But by going gently and, 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 and approaching the subject gently, uh, you need not disturb vegetation too much. And as we go a little bit forward with this talk, you'll see that disturbing vegetation can be really important. Keep below the skyline, become a commando, get down on your belly if you have to, and in some cases you need to, uh, otherwise your subject is going to fly away. Keep quiet, keep quiet. Insects can, can hear. I know it, it might be a different form of hearing. How many of us out there have crept up on a butterfly and got to the point where you want to take your picture, you've pressed the button and the noise of the shutter has frightened it away. I'm sure it's happened to everybody. I know it certainly happened to me. Mornings and evenings are the best time when the insects are cool and settled. Now, last year, I was out in Bulgaria, met a couple of really good friends, and I think they're with us this evening. <coughs> hello, Alan, hello, Harry. And we got up at 4.30 every morning. Uh, we did that for the best part of a week and it was wonderful because we, we were out in the country uh, just as it was getting light and we got the best of the day. So mornings and evenings, insects settle down in the evenings, they are approachable. And in the mornings when they're cold, they're, they're very approachable. So field craft is an important aspect of what we're doing. Here I am uh, down on my belly and what I'm doing, I'm, I'm actually photographing uh, a northern dune tiger beetle in the dunes. Uh, it's a great way of getting a lot of sand in your pockets and in your shoes, but it works, as we'll see a little bit later. Fieldcraft. Oh, and, and another important thing is, is a hat for your head so that you don't burn your, your bald bit up like I've got. Right, many years ago, when I first got interested in, in photography, not just photographing interest, but nature photography in general, it was, it was the days of slides. We'd never thought about digital back then. And uh, it was frustrating sometimes with slides because you only had to have a third of a stop under or a third of a stop overexposed and your slide wouldn't be as good as it could have been. Exposure was difficult with slides. And uh, I very often got my 36 exposures back 
and and what I'd looked forward to became an instant disappointment. I'm sure that's happened to many, many people who used to work with slides. So I developed a little mnemonic for myself. Uh, I carried it with me in my pocket for quite a while. And it's ever so simple. It's just called bless, an easy word to remember. But it stands for background, lighting, exposure, sharpness, and subject. Um, the background, backgrounds are important in natural history photography, and they are particularly important in insect photography. Um, getting backgrounds with lots of white blades of grass and, and busy backgrounds and things like that is really going to distract from the subject that you're trying to photograph. Here we've got a magpie moth, and it's resting on a rock. Uh, and the rock is, is not interfering with viewing the subject. We've got a clear view of the magpie moth and, and a background that is, is not disruptive to it. Uh, it goes with it. So that's background. Lighting, of course, is very important on many things. I don't care to use flash if I can avoid it. Here we've got an eyed hawk moth one that I'd caught in my trap the previous evening. And sometimes I let them stay in the trap, keep them in, in the shade, keep them cool. Uh, and the following evening, just gently take them out, put them onto a perch. And they, they're still cool. And in many cases, not, not all moths do this, by the way. Some of them fly off the instant they, they see you coming. But with some of the bigger moths, you can set them up like this for a photograph. This was photographed on my patio. Uh, with a tripod, the, the moth, the eyed hawk moth, what they do when, when they feel that they're in potentially in any kind of danger, they open the wings to reveal these eyes, which would startle a predator. Hopefully that's the case. This one just stayed there quite happily for me. Uh, let me take its photograph. I don't remember the shutter speed, but I know that it was evening and that the light wasn't particularly good. But it was good in one fashion in that uh, it wasn't contrasty light. I, I hadn't got, uh, it was probably overcast um, and I hadn't got any uh, dark shadows or any burnt out highlights. Uh, <clears throat> just set the moth up nice and gently with a tripod, without a flash, even though it might have been a long exposure, I still got the image I wanted. However, there are times when you can't take the photograph if you don't have a flash. And here we are, look, this moth has caught a gecko. Uh, it, I, I, I photographed this a couple of years ago. I was, I was on the island of Corfu with a group of friends uh, of Corfu Butterfly Conservation. And we were staying in a, an old Venetian villa, large villa on the top of the hill. And they got the villa painted with these rather garish walls, you know, sort of orangey pink, but what they'd got at intervals was a low power light bulb, probably only something like 40 watts, just to light the path that people walked around. And in the evening, it was magical because those lights attracted all kinds of insects, not just moths, but beetles. And we, we, we had frogs come in as well and, and centipedes and all kinds of wonderful things. And I thought it was fascinating, but you would not have been able to photograph anything there because it was dark, except for the light, the, the light around these low powered light bulbs. And I'd been watching these geckos. These are Turkish geckos or Mediterranean geckos. I'd been watching them as they stalked and hunted uh, these insects. And this one actually caught this moth. Uh, and I, I'd got my camera, uh, but I'd, I'd put a small flash on it. Only a small flash, a tiny little thing, or not much bigger than a couple of OXO cubes. With, on the Olympus camera. I think it's got a guide number of about seven and a half, eight, something like that. Not, not powerful at all, but for the kind of work that I was doing with a small macro lens, it was perfect. Uh, and I just managed to get it before the, the gecko went away. So I got really lucky with that one. So you see lighting, you do need flash from time to time. Even though I don't like to use it, it's nice to know how to use it if you have to. I'm gonna take another sip of water while we think about exposure. Thank you. 
Exposure is not quite such a problem these days. In the days of film, as I said earlier, you had to get it right. And we used exposure meters, which we held up, or we used gray cards that we could take an exposure reflection reflected, um, measurement from. And you had to get it right, particularly with some of the finer slides that, you know, a third of us stop either way and you, your picture was ruined. These days, we don't have that kind of uh, dilemma to a great degree. But you still have to be careful when you're photographing white subject. This is a black veined white. And this one is, is very, very new. I think it had climbed up this hoary plantain after it had just hatched. It was really, really pristine. Uh, but the sun was coming in and out of the clouds. And so I had to be really careful because it would have been easy to change the color of this butterfly into something gray or to do something else with the exposure and to burn out the whites. And we don't want that. You want to get it exactly right. Wonderfully these days, how lucky we are because we've got something on the back of the camera which is so useful and it's the histogram. If you look at the histogram when you're taking your pictures, and I think most of you, because you're all part of the nature group, you'll know this, your histogram will tell you what your exposure is. Uh, and although the, the aim is to try to get the curve uh, all, all in the frame, maybe they, they've got something called ETTR, exposed to the right, get it a little bit closer to the right, so that your blacks aren't blocked up and your whites aren't burnt out. And it's so good these days that we've got the ability to do this. Uh, whereas with slides, of course, we hadn't unless we were very careful. Exposure is important. These days, you can adjust it in Photoshop. Uh, but it's nice to get it right in camera, in my opinion. <clears throat> what about sharpness? For your picture to, to be really bright, to have quality, it must be sharp. Sometimes you can get the most perfect subject in the most beautiful location on the most beautiful plant. Everything's just beautiful and right. But for whatever reason, it comes back and it's not sharp. And you can't do a lot about that. I know you can sharpen in Photoshop and Lightroom, but it's not the same thing. And this, for me, was the joy of being able to stack images. Because going back to when I had the Nikon D850 and the 200 millimeter micro lens, even if I used uh, shutter uh, apertures like F11, F16, and heaven forbid these days F22, I still would not have been able to have got this. This is the caterpillar of the dot moth. It's about an inch long in old money. I still would not have been able to get it sharp from front to back. And as you can see from the image, it is sharp. It's sharp throughout the picture. And the reason it is that I did a stack of only about five or six uh, images, blended them together in camera, and I got the resultant JPEG, which showed me that um, the picture was sharp from front to back. Because I could do it in camera, I got the result of the stacking in camera with the Olympus in a couple of seconds. So I knew that I got the result I wanted. And if I hadn't, I would have been able to do some adjustments and take it again and then get it sharp. And this for me, everybody, was the great joy. It was a revelation to be able to stack in camera and within one or two seconds to have a picture on the back of the camera which told me exactly what I had got. With my Nikons, and, and I could do it with my Nikons, but, but then I'd have to take it into Lightroom or Photoshop to stack it. This did it on the back of the camera. And uh, it's manna from heaven, as far as I'm concerned. It's just wonderful. Sharpness. This is my little setup. Uh, Gitzo camera. It's a Gitzo tripod with the Olympus camera. That I've sold all my Nikon gear, by the way. Uh, bless it. I didn't want to do that because I was very, very attached to it and all the lenses and all the other things I've got. But my wife kept saying, why is all this camera stuff getting dust on it? And so anyway, I sold it. And it did well. Um, I got I got a very good price, uh, so I was quite happy with that. Now I'm I'm all Olympus. In fact, I've just gone out. This is a sixty millimeter lens. Is the one that you're looking at here. Lovely little lens, a third of the weight of the, the cameras that I used to use. Uh, I've got a Gitzo tripod. The center post can be taken out quite easily, so that I can get the 
tripod right down to ground level if I need to do so, and I can do it very quickly. Uh, I've just purchased this week, in fact, Olympus or OM, it's Olympus system these days, OM system. I've just bought their 90 millimeter macro, which has been long awaited. Um, and it'll give me more reach effectively on 35 millimeters. It's 180 millimeters equivalent. Uh, I've, I've taken it out a couple of times and it's, it's been very, very well reviewed and I'm very happy with it up to now. But this is my little setup. Um, I like to work off a tripod. I know handheld these days with in-camera stabilization and lens stabilization and so on, you can hold it. I, I find I can compose better from a tripod. It's not just a matter of holding it steady. It's a composition. You can set your composition a lot better. And in the days of slide, you really needed to use a tripod anyway, because it was so slow. Finally, we come on to the subject, B-L-E-S-S. -S. Some people would say, well, you should really have the subject at the beginning. And I gently argue and say, no, your subject is ultra important, but you've got to have all these other things first before you can do justice to it. This is the beautiful Apollo butterfly, again on a hoary plantain. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful butterfly, but like all other butterflies and like all other insects, it has a very short life. And in that short life, there's every chance of it being hurt by a predator, damaging its wing in some way. And you could get not just Apollos, but all other kinds of insects that they're not at their best. Now, we human beings, we like to have portraits taken when we look our best. Um, we'll doll ourselves up to go and have our portrait taken or do things, you know, wear a tie or whatever. Insects are the same in a way. If you want to do a good image, you really need one that's in pristine condition, not tatty, because even though it might be a rare butterfly or a rare insect, if it's tatty, it's never going to look its best. So there we are. Little hint, little tip. Bless, bless you. B-L-E-S-S. -S. I think that explains it all, really. Part of your field craft, remember all the things like this for your photography. So here we go. Let's have a look at one or two insects. I'm going to have another sip of water and we'll be doing, I'm going to try and finish in about 20, 25 minutes so we can have a chance for some questions if you have any. Mm. It's only water, there's no gin in it, believe me. Uh, might be, have a gin later. Yes, insects, and again, close to home and on the continent. Where I live here in, in Form, beyond the Sefton coast, we've got about 14 different kinds of shield bugs. Some of them are very common, like this one. This is the hairy shield bug. You can see it's got little hairs uh, around it. It's a lovely thing. Uh, it's a fairly common one. We do have some rare ones, but they're more difficult to find and photograph. I was almost on the point of throwing this image away. I thought, oh no, I, it's, it's got, you know, it shows you what it is, but it's, it, it didn't look quite right. So I just turned it round. And I think it looks a lot better now. Sometimes with, with your photographs, with your images, if you do a bit of cropping or just maybe turn it from landscape to portrait, it can change an image. It can make it look better. Sometimes, and I think this is quite important, sometimes flipping it uh, in Photoshop or Lightroom so that it, it you know, you're changing it round. Because where we are, where we live, we read from left to right. And sometimes looking at, a, at, a, at an image from left to right reads a lot easier rather than having the subject looking right to left. Just a little thing. I, I'm, I'm a bit fussy like that. Some people don't bother. Anyway, here's another shield bug. This is the uh, Hawthorne shield bug. And uh, it's in situ, it, it's actually in its habitat, it's, it's actually on a hawthorn, a lovely thing. But most shield bugs are, especially when they're nice and fresh, when they've gone into their final instar and they're all nice and fresh, they're beautiful things. As I say, we have, I think, 14 species here. And I think in, in the UK overall, there are a lot more. But you have to remember with our insect life here, in what they call the north, is very much less than you lucky guys who live down south. You've got so many more butterflies and insects that we have up here. Another one that looks like a shield bug, but it isn't. It's, uh, it's a relative of shield bugs. It's a dock bug. 
uh, again, a fairly common insect, not always easy to find because they blend in very easily with the subject, that the, with the background that they're on. And here we've got a, an old leaf that it's on. And beetles, let's, let's have a look at a few beetles. The, the statement reputedly made by Charles uh, Darwin, but it wasn't, it was made by a guy called Haldane, who said, the good Lord must have been inordinately fond of beetles because he made so many of them. And it's true, the Coleoptera, there's a, it's a huge, huge uh, number of beetles, not just in the UK, but in the world. And this is one of our special ones on the Sefton coast. This is the northern dune tiger beetle. It's our speciality. Uh, it's only found here on the Sefton coast and in a very small location in Cumbria called Drigg. It isn't found anywhere else in the UK apart from here. It's got lookalikes, but they won't be the northern dune tiger beetle. Of course, the, the common one is the green tiger beetle. And they see you before you see them. If you recall that picture where I'm lying on the belly doing the command, I was photographing one of these. And this one is outside. It's making a burrow. Uh, they do these half moon burrows. And that's where probably it will lay an egg for the next generation. They move very quickly. You have to stalk them. You really do have to get down on your tummy and crawl on the sand uh, and, and not give them any indication that you're there. And more often than not, they'll fly away. But they are truly beautiful things. Northern June tiger beetles, one of our Sefton specialities. Here we've got uh, a thick-thighed beetle, <laughs> which is difficult to say if you've got a list. A thick-thighed beetle or... Um, uh, yes, I've, I've forgotten what, what its other name is, but I think of it as a thick thigh beetle, a swollen thigh beetle, I think is the proper name. And they say it's a lovely green beetle on, on a fluorescence, and, and sometimes you, you can go for hogweeds and things like that. It's a good thing in the summer, you find lots of insects on them. This particular beetle, is it, it, this is a male, and it, it attracts the opposite sex by having really big thighs. So I would be absolutely useless in the mating game if I was one of these. A beetle that sometimes I get in my moth trap uh, is this particular one. I'm never unhappy to get it because it's a lovely thing, but it has got a nasty habit of smelling unbelievably bad. This is um, a sexton beetle with the incredible Latin name of Necrophorus investigator. As a sexton beetle, of course, it finds uh, dead things, a mouse or, or something that's dead, and it buries it. That, that's where it lays its eggs and its young will feed on that. Uh, this, is, this is a strange one, really, because it hasn't got its usual accompaniment of ticks. Well, mites, not ticks. It would be mites. Usually they're covered in mites. Uh, why the mites would want to go on something that smells so appallingly bad, I can't imagine. But they do. You don't really want these in your garden, although I've got them in mine. And I like to photograph them, lily beetles. They can do a lot of damage to your lilies. But I forgive them a little bit for that because I think they're quite beautiful. You have to be careful photographing them because they're very, very sensitive. And here's a pine chafer just before it takes off. This is not a UK insect. It was photographed on the continent. The wings behind as they're unfurled are now being seriously studied, I understand, by science because of the way they fold. And it is quite remarkable when you think that an insect as big and as heavy as this can open its, uh, its wing case and then flap out the wings like that, which have been so delicately and so accurately folded that it can actually fly. And now science is studying this to see if they can put it into anything that we use for flight. Uh, so nature still has a lot to teach us, I think. But here we are. This is another chafer beetle, uh, a result of one of our early mornings last year in Bulgaria. Uh, oh, superb mornings. And whilst it's on, I've got to tell you about it because I think it's one of the, the, the best times I've, I've really been. And I've been abroad many, many times. I've been to Bulgaria many times. But this was special because we were so lucky to have dew for almost every morning we got up and so we find these insects covered in dew which adds a little di an extra dimension if you do it right to to the to the subject i think 
this chafer beetle was covered in dew. It couldn't move, of course, it was cold. Uh, and so it let me take its photograph. Um, it, was a, it was a super time. In my garden, I get insects, uh, quite a few. This, I, I wasn't aware when I worked with this one, it's a bumblebee mimic, mimic called the Narcissus bulb fly. Uh, and what it does, a naughty pest actually, it lays eggs on the bottom of your daffodil stems, the eggs hatch, the grubs go down below, um, then they eat all your daffodil bulbs. So I didn't know that, I just thought this is a wonderful thing to photograph. And it was, it was quite docile, it, it allowed me to, to gently move it from where I found it onto, this is the, what remains of um, uh, a poppy, a Welsh poppy, uh, and it just sat there and let me take its photograph. I didn't worry, my daffodils are all all right. They, they haven't interfered with them. And as I say, it's a bumblebee mimic, and mimic, and it's a beautiful thing. I really like it. Robber flies. Now that's another subject. Uh, these are the the, um, the 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 real danger things if you are an insect, a small insect. They fly very quickly and they catch insects on the wing, and they do it brilliantly well. This is a European one. I don't know the species. Uh, it's a female. They've got a proboscis, which is like a dagger. And so I'm told when they catch an insect, they use it usually to pierce the eye of its prey. And then they suck out whatever they want. They are, you know, th these in prehistoric times, these would have been the velociraptors. Uh, they really are powerful and scary hunters. Uh, where we were in Bulgaria last year, we saw a lot of these. Uh, and watch them catching things. In the evening, went out and photographed them. Here we've got a pair in copula. The females on the top, the males on the bottom. Um, nice to photograph, evening light. So we, we went out in the evenings and in the mornings. The following morning, they were still there. The female was still in the position on the top and the males on the bottom, utterly exhausted and covered in dew. Uh, it, it had been there, I don't know, eight, nine hours. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, that's what's known as stamina, isn't it, really? Wonderful things. We have them here on the Sefton coast. Um, this is the dune robber fly with its prey. They're not easy to approach. So once again, you've got to adopt commando style in order to take the photographs. Dung flies. I actually saw some of these yesterday. You can find dung flies, so it seems to me, all the way through the year. Um, they're only tiny, but they are really photogenic if you can get them up close. These are on old seed heads of ivy. Uh, we were by some ivy yesterday and we found a couple of these. And I like flies. Uh, I've, I've just I said a little bit earlier, I've just bought, I've just read a book on flies, which was really, really interesting. Uh, I've got it here. It's this one. Uh, I recommend it to you. It's it's humorous. And uh, sorry, I better turn it the right way up. I suppose uh, it's really humorous. It's by Erica McAllister, who um, I would think she works with the British Museum. And I like flies now. I never did, but I do now because they're quite photogenic. Here we've got a tachinid fly or a tachinid fly. Uh, I shouldn't like them really because they parasitize my moths and my butterflies. They lay eggs on the caterpillars and uh, and, and they kill the caterpillars because the other one, the, the fly comes out and eats them. But they are very, very photogenic. This one is on apple mint. It's photographed just about a half a mile from my home here in Formby. If you can get them as a pair, they're very difficult to direct when they're like this, you know. You can't give them any instructions. But when they're busy like this, they tend to be occupied and you've got a better chance of photographing them. I actually had the opportunity with these after I'd taken my initial snaps to gently move that twig so that I'd got a better background and they didn't fly off, at least not for a few seconds. I got my image and after a few seconds, they flew away, still in cop, but um, I'd got my image. These are two Tachina flies, Tachina fera, um, which we've got here on the coast. Hoverflies are beautiful. We've got lots of hoverflies in this country. Some of them really big. The volucellas are enormous. They're the size of a bumblebee. And they're really, really attractive things. Every spring 
here, and, and, and I know in a lot of other parts of the UK, we get St. Mark's flies. Here we've got a pair in cop. The female is on the left, she's bigger, and the male is on the right. You can see he's got large eyes. Um, they're a wonderful insect because when they appear, usually around St. Mark's Day uh, in the spring, they are a wonderful food for our migrating birds. The birds that come up, the chiff chaffs and the willow warblers, they make a wonderful feast for these, as well as our native birds, robins and things like that, uh, because they appear in enormous numbers, clouds of them sometimes, St. Mark's flies. So they're a feast for our birds who at this time of year are either feeding young or they've just come off migration. Let's have a look at the Orthoptera grasshoppers. We've only got three on the Sefton coast. This is a tiny one. It's the mottled grasshopper, only about half an inch long in old money and sitting here um, on, on a plantain seed head. It's got a tiny insect with a large Latin name, Mammalia tetix maculata, uh, but it's lovely. And it appears in different uh, colors, uh, different shades of color. Grasshoppers, when you look at them close up, are really, really interesting to see. Another one of ours is the field grasshopper. Um, this is a male on, on a cat's ear plant. And this one's from overseas. It was bounding about all over the place. It's the large banded grasshopper. I asked a colleague, I said, do you think you could hold um, this, this plant in front of it and see if it will go on? And luckily it did. It landed on it and I was delighted with it. Um, it stayed there just for a few seconds. I ran a few shots off. This isn't stacked, this is just single shot. Uh, and I managed to get one that was pretty sharp throughout. Um, I don't think I would use it in exhibition because sometimes people say, oh, I don't like the reflected highlights there. Well, of course, you can't do anything about it because you're photographing in the sun. And I like it because I think it shows the wing of a nation as well. So uh, anyway, this is the final one of our third, the uh, common green grasshopper on a, on a poppy seed head. Uh, again, I don't know. Whether, I don't think this was stacked because the antenna, the back antenna, isn't in focus, which is something we can do now with stacking. You get both antennae in in focus. Bush crickets. This is one of the first bush crickets recorded in this part of the UK, the northwest, and it was in my garden. I don't know how it got there. Maybe it came in on a plant that I bought. Uh, lovely thing, but they've got these huge antennae, and uh, very difficult to get those fully in focus. Well, as long as you've got the body, this is a female, you can tell by its oviposter. Uh, an oak bush cricket, we get those here as well. Um, here we've got another insect, the spangle gall, uh, little, those little round things that you can see on the, on the oak leaves. Lovely things. And this is, this is really, um, the, I think it's one of the ugliest insects I've ever seen, but I did say at the beginning that they're all beautiful, and I think this is too. This was from our Bulgarian trip last year. Um, it's got a strange name, the woodlouse glandular bush cricket. It's enormous. It's almost as big as my thumb. It's huge. Two of these would make a dinner. And it, it makes a noise when it walks about. It walks quite quickly, so it's difficult to get a photograph. Uh, but I like seeing it anyway. These are the dragonflies uh, of the UK. Um, I like dragonflies, but I, you know, they can be difficult to make a good picture with because of the shape, long body, uh, long wings going the other way. This is one, this is one of our British ones, a moorland dragonfly, the golden ring dragonfly, Cordulogaster boltonii. Uh, a lovely thing. I think this is a male. And in the mornings, if you find these early, they're very, very docile. They will actually sit on your finger if you want them to, and they'll give them a little nibble. Won't hurt you because they can't get through the skin. But they're beautiful insects. These are plentiful. This is a, a female blue tail. Uh, they come in different color forms before they mature. This one's uh, the purple form. And this is from my garden pond, a common daughter. It's only just come out of its exuvia. And in this stage, they're called tenorals. The wings are still very soft. The body is still very soft. And it takes a while for them to mature. Uh, this is a male. And this is what the male looks like when it's fully matured. A beautiful insect. It's common, but nevertheless, it is 
a beautiful thing. Being common doesn't mean to say it can't be beautiful. Another dragonfly of moorland, uh, the black darter, this is a female. And near my home, we've got a little brook, it actually flows behind Tesco in Formby, but it's a lovely little clear stream and every late May and June, we get these wonderful, wonderful damselflies, the, um, the banded demoiselle, uh, Calopteryx splendens. Uh, they are easy to photograph or relatively easy to photograph when it's cool or on a day when it's rained. Uh, if you try to photograph them in the heat of the day, well, you're going to be in for a surprise because they won't stay. They don't stay. They see you before you see them. Here we've got a couple. The male is on the right and the female is on the left. A dragon, a, a, a demoiselle we don't have here, but you do have it in the south of England, the beautiful demoiselle, Calopteryx Virgo. I photographed this on the continent uh, and I'd watched it for quite some time. It was flying up and coming down with with food. Here it's got a midge. It's got a midge. Uh, I tried to approach it and it left its perch. So I backed off and I put a 300 millimeter lens on and after a while it came back, caught a midge and let me take its photograph. Once again, I was happy with this because it shows all the beautiful venation in the wings, but I don't think you'd be able to use it in a, an exhibition. Judges are funny with things like that. Here's something that doesn't quite know what it is. Uh, a spoon winged lace wing, um, one of the antlions, beautiful thing. Uh, I don't know, antlions don't know whether they want to be butterflies or dragonflies, they're sort of in between, but a very, very fierce predator, especially when it's in the larval form. They flick ants down into a little hole and, and, and eat them. Right, I love insects and I love photographing insects, but my, my main interest is a love of Lepidoptera. Now we're almost approaching 4.30, so I'm going to go through these last pictures quite quickly so that we can have time for a few questions if you have them. This is the beautiful Niobe fritillary. Lepidoptera, of course, Greek, lepid, scale, optera, wings, scaled wings, and they do all have scaled wings. You can photograph them in this stage. You can collect caterpillars. This is the caterpillar of the vapor moth. Here's the caterpillar of the drinker moth. Ra rather a large one, you know, perhaps as big as one of your fingers. These are the caterpillars that feed our cuckoos, or they should, because at one time they were very, very plentiful. These days they aren't. You don't see anywhere near as many these days. Consequently, that's why we don't have the cuckoo here anymore on, on the uh, Sefton coast. I don't think I've heard one here for many, many years. There's still plenty of these caterpillars up in Scotland, and so you hear the cuckoo up in Scotland. A big caterpillar, the elephant, hawk caterpillar. It's got a bit of a trunk and looks like a, an elephant. And many butterflies and uh, moths get their names from the caterpillar form. This is a, a caterpillar with attitude, the puss moth caterpillar. Uh, it's got a, a, a little gland underneath, if you can just see my pointer, underneath here there's a little gland that can um, secrete formic acid. And it's quite strong formic acid. Uh, as a, as a means of defense, but it produces a beautiful moth and we'll see that in a minute. This caterpillar uh, wanders around in the autumn and sometimes you can come across one uh, on its perambulations. It's looking for a place to hibernate and pupate. Uh, it's the caterpillar of the pale tussock moth. And here's one that I was very happy to take. It's a spurge hawk moth caterpillar beautiful thing, very, very colourful, and not in the least afraid because it knows that it's toxic. It eats euphorbia plants, and they, of course, have got a very toxic milky sap, and it knows that if anything eats it, it's not going to enjoy it anyway. Uh, curves, I think, are important in natural history photography. Beautiful thing, the spurge. The spurge hawk moth itself is rather dull, actually. Um, caterpillars have a hard time. Here we've got an eyed hawk moth caterpillar that's been parasitized by uh, ichneumon wasps, little wasps that uh, lay eggs on the caterpillar and then it hatches, they hatch and, and they eat it alive. Pupae too can be beautiful. These, these are, this is the pupal stage of the black veined white that we saw just now. Our common butterflies can be difficult to photograph. Small white, a cabbage white, one of the cabbage whites. Uh, very fresh, 
and I know it is because I, I reared these as caterpillars and popped it on this bluebell. This wouldn't work in an exhibition because part of the head is obscured behind the flower of the bluebell. What you do is you need to see all of the butterfly if you can. And here we've got two small whites. As soon as I've taken the photograph, they've gone, they were away. The large white is a butterfly that very few people have got photographs of, probably because nobody ever thinks to photograph them. And if you do say, oh, it's only a large white, I've got loads of those, and you haven't, because they're not easy to photograph. This was in my garden again, it's on some rocket early in the morning while it was still quite cool. One of the most common butterflies we've got here now, which wasn't here when we came here 40 years ago, is the speckled wood. It's probably the most common butterfly we've got. And a small one, the small heath. Not much bigger than your thumbnail, but a lovely thing just the same, one of the heath. And these are declining too, which is a great shame, as are these, the wall butterflies. I like these, and yet they are seriously declining, particularly here. I found a place where they want to rest. This is the underside of the wall butterfly. And I found it year after year. There has to be a reason why they come back to this location. Uh, these, of course, the generation doesn't last year after year. They probably only live a few weeks, if that. But there's something there that attracts them to this location because this is where they like to roost. The butter-colored fly, the butterfly, the one that got its name, the brimstone. Sadly, even though they are for this knoll, uh, we don't get them here. We don't have the food plant here. And a very common one, of course. So you'll be seeing some of these soon. Uh, and then you get the second hatch in the late summer and the autumn, the comma. Small skippers having fun. And a butterfly that I think has got a name that it shouldn't have, the common blue. OK, it is relatively common. Here it is on native valerian. But it's a beautiful thing. A really delightful insect, and it's a shame to call it a common blue. I like Polyamata sicarus a lot better. We only have a very few of these in the UK, right down on the south coast and on the Isle of Wight, the Glanville fritillary. A really, really lovely thing. And these are taken uh, as stacked images as well. Here we've got two on a dandelion seed head. They were very, very fresh, and I photograph these after we'd had a morning of rain. Uh, so, so they weren't, they were still fairly docile and I was able to photograph them without them flying away. And you see with stacking now, you can get both antennae in focus, which I think is a delight really. I was with a friend a few years back and we were despairing of ever finding anything. Again, we were overseas. This is a common butterfly, the black veined white, and yet we'd, we'd hardly seen anything to photograph all afternoon. And then suddenly a huge cloud of these descended on the meadow where we were, and we didn't know where to look first. And I didn't set them up like this. This is the way they actually perched. Lovely things, black veined whites, and very, very common on the continent. A Balkan copper, uh, just resting in the morning. And Queen of Spain fritillary. I was in a location in Bulgaria under some high powered um, electricity lines. And in the meadow underneath these lines, I could hear them crackling above me. Uh, it was absolutely heaving with butterflies and other insects too, bush crickets and grasshoppers and all kinds of things. But they were all going bananas. They were all flying and doing things and no chance at all taking a photograph. It was hot, hot and humid. And in the distance, we heard some thunder. And after about five minutes, almost as though someone had switched a switch, they all started to settle. It was magic. I've never seen anything like it before or since. All the butterflies and all the insects that have been flapping around all decided to settle. And they were very, very approachable. Why that would be changing air pressure, I don't know. Um, so I filled my boots. I, I started this a beautiful marble fritillary. I took as many photographs as I could, a pair of um, silver studded blues in cop and so on and so forth. And whilst everybody else was running back to the van, I was photographing, but I got absolutely soaked from my trouble. But it was a magical moment. And we do have those from time to time. Uh, I trap moths, let them go. I don't do anything to them. I always let them go. Because uh, I like them, I think they're beautiful. And a lot of people 
don't know that moths can be beautiful because they don't see them, they only fly at night. Here we've got the puss moth, which we saw the caterpillar earlier, it's a male, lovely, lovely thing. Um, a scarce silver lines on a, an emerging poppy. Again, a beautiful thing. They're all beautiful in my opinion. These lovely sallow kittens, two together. If you, sometimes if you get two, you can, or if you get three, you can photograph them like that. And another hawk moth, the lime hawk moth, uh, just on a, a little bit of twig that has a, a little bit of feature to it, uh, just to add interest to the image. I reared some vapor moths a few years ago, well, about three years ago, and uh, I reared them as caterpillars. Unfortunately, one of those that pupated came out, it was a female. Now, the vapor moths don't have, vapor females don't have wings, they just have vestigial wings. And this one was kind enough. I, I put it in my uh, my veranda to photograph, and before I knew it, a male appeared. I'd never seen a male vapor moth before in, in my garden, ne never recorded one. It mated with it almost instantaneously, and 15 minutes later, this lovely thing started to lay eggs. It laid about 50, uh, sorry, it laid about 300 eggs, and then after a couple of days, it died. It had done its job. Remarkable things. This is the male with huge antenna to get the scent of the pheromone from the female. We have these lovely things, our only silk moth, the emperor moth. We have these over on Freshfield June Heath, just about three miles from my home. This was attracted with a pheromone, which I'm not really happy doing. I, I don't do it very often, but we wanted to do a survey and see how many emperor, male emperor moths we could find. Quite a few came to the pheromone. And this is where I love to be, out in the countryside, particularly in the early morning, when you can find insects with dew. Here we've got a, a spotted fritillary. And in the evenings as well, this beautiful black veined white had settled on this grass, not knowing that it had got covered with gossamer. A spider had been there at some point. And so it got gossamer on its antennae as well. And I think that added just a little bit of an extra dimension to the image. When they're covered in dew, uh, they're beautiful, as long as there's not too much. Here we've got, um, yes, I'm going to have to remember what this, this one is, uh, one of the blues. Uh, I've actually got a crib sheet down here. I knew I'd, I'd come across one that I wouldn't remember. Um, this is Amanda's blue, again, covered in dew. I, I truly enjoy this, finding and photographing insects uh, in the early morning. And we did that last year with my two friends, Alan and Harry, who are with us tonight. Sometimes you get two for the price of one. I think this is a silver studded blue and an Essex skipper. The one thing I wanted and I still haven't achieved is to photograph one of these butterflies with dew, uh, with their proboscis drinking dew, because that's what they do. They get washed with dew, pure water, and they drink it also. I waited patiently with this one, but the proboscis never came out. I think it was still fast asleep. And you guys down south, you have this beautiful butterfly. It is coming north. I think it's reached as far as Nottingham. So it's not got far to go. I don't know if it'll reach us while I'm still here. The beautiful, uh, yeah, come on, Trevor, I'm, I'm forgetting. It's the marbled white, of course it is. It's just covered in dew. Uh, again, I photographed this on the continent, but it's, it, it is a stunning butterfly and, and certainly one of my favourites. So there we are. My little uh, mottled grasshopper is reminding us all, is my conscience like Jiminy Cricket, to think about background, lighting, exposure, stillness and subject. I'm really grateful to you all. Thank you for listening to me witter on for the last hour and 10 minutes. It's been a great pleasure. And if you've got any questions, I'll do my very best to try and answer them. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Trevor. That was really enjoyable. Yes, we have got some questions already, so I'll start at the top. Just uh, that will give people a chance to add questions at the bottom. They, uh, shall, I, shall I stop sharing, Anne, for a moment? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, that might be a good idea. OK, thank there you. we are. I'm back with you all. Right. Uh, the, the first one, 
because I lost the mess, uh, the thing. Now it moved away. Um, what's your uh, view on LED lights for lighting? Have you used them instead of flash? I know I have an LED light that I use sometimes. Yes, I, I have. I have got uh, a couple of. I think they're little man frottos. I've got a couple in my camera bag, and I do use them from time to time. Nice to fill in shadows. Not not nothing wrong with it. It doesn't. It won't hurt anything. Uh, I've got a couple of little ones, and they've got three three settings. You know, sort of small medium large uh, light so i do use them not particularly often but sometimes especially in the evening and the morning it's nice just to to put that little bit of extra light onto the subject not too much so from time to time yeah nothing wrong with led lights yeah use them if you need to uh, um can you recommend a, a guide or an online resource for insect identification i don't know what book you use well, yeah, I mean, that's a big subject. And, and I have got a, a, a book, just one book will never cover them all. I've got a whole raft of, of books. Um, the one that I use for the UK, I'll just reach over and have a look at the title and tell you what it is. It's pretty good, actually. Here it is. I'll hold it up. Can you see it? Yeah. Complete yeah. Book of British Insects by Michael Chinnery. It says it's complete, but there are insects that aren't in here because to, to have a book that would cover them all, you'd need a, a vast yeah. volumes. But that's the one I use. I've yeah. got others for Southern Europe and um, specific books on things like dragonflies. I've got on uh, on moths. I've got um, Lewington and Townsend. So it, it, it's horses for courses, really. If you want something general, then this one by Michael Chinnery will co co cover it. Uh, if you want to learn a lot more about photographing insects, may I recommend a book to you by my good friend John Bevington. John wrote a book on photographing insects, uh, probably about five years ago, I suppose, John, and it contains lots and lots of good things. So if it's still in print and you can still obtain it, get yourself a copy. It'll tell you a lot of things. It's way out of date now and it's out of print. Is it, John? OK, OK. Uh, I, I would recommend this one, which is the one that, oh, I don't know whether I can get it. I'll just say, uh, uh, by Brock. That's okay, the yeah, Paul Brock, you, yes. Paul Brock, yes. that's the one that you, the people like the Field Studies Council and people for insect identification. I mean, obviously not for specifically for photographing, but that's, I think, the recommended, covers the most different insects but Paul, Paul is very good actually I, I met Paul I, I went with him he, he came up here to photograph dark tussock caterpillars uh four or five years ago pre-covid um and yes I agree I've got his book on insects of uh, southern Europe and mm -hmm. it's excellent so yeah, uh, the one yeah. of Britain and Ireland is also excellent it's, yeah, I it's agree. got a new new edition and it's huge <laughs> yeah yeah it, it take a lot of going through uh, right. What combination of parameters do you use as a starting point for focus stacking on your Olympus camera, especially for butterflies? Well, I yeah, photographing butterflies like those that I've shown you when they're resting and, and you haven't got, you don't need too many slices of um, images to get, what you really need to do is in, you're going to put your sensor parallel to the insect. And the thing that you want to try and get in focus is get both antennae in focus. And I only use a stack of about six images. And the um, the differential I use, this is for the Olympus, I think is four. Now, that's my setting, five, stacked in, five or six stacked images. It will go up to 15, will, the Olympus, but I don't need 15. Oftentimes, if I've taken more than five or six, I find that I don't need to use them. So, and I focus, on the, the part of the insect that is closest to me. You don't, you don't need to be too fussy with your focus because when you do the stacking like I do in camera, it will actually jump back a little bit to focus in front and then it'll move forward and, and change the focus every time it moves forward. I found five, six, seven stacks in most cases will do all that I wanted to do. And what, what aperture do you use um, for your... Did you say what aperture do I yeah. use? Yeah. All right. Well, it, it really depends now on, on the background. If you have got a background that's close to your subject, you, you should really think about using a fairly wide aperture. But there's a, there's a caveat there. 
if you're going to use a wide aperture, I'm going to relate to, to my Olympus equipment. Um, my 60 millimeter macro will go down, I think, to f3.5, or it might go down to f3. But that's not the sweet spot for the lens. To, to get the best of the lens, my, my lens, I need to shoot at something like f5.6 to f8. And that's the sweet spot. That's when it's going to give me the best work. However, if you've got a background that's very close and you want to throw it out, then use a wider aperture. And you, you're still stacking. So if, if with the wider aperture, you want more stacks, then you just up the number of stacks from five, six, seven, up to perhaps eight or nine. Uh, all you're trying to do really is to get all the subject in focus, but to get the background out of focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, have you any tips, uh, that's your friend, uh, Danny, any tips on photographing insects in flight? Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't really tried it at the moment, but again, I, I ought to be a, an Olympus ambassador, I think, or <laughs> I ought to get paid for this. Olympus has got this wonderful thing whereby, and I'm not going to remember what it's called now, it'll come to me in a minute, Pro Capture, Pro Capture, where you can actually, you're on focus with a butterfly, with an insect, which may be just about to take off. And what it does, it keeps taking continuous photographs. And after it's taken quite a few, it, it dumps them and keeps taking more and more and more photographs, dropping some off. So that when the insect does actually fly, you can press the shutter and you're catching the butterfly in flight and you've got all the images pre-flight because the camera's taking them all the time. And then when it's gone out of frame, of course, you just stop doing it. Now, I've yet to do this, and it's something I want to try to do this oh. summer, if I can. I think it's called Pro Capture, uh, Olympus Pro Capture. I'm probably sure that other cameras may do that as well, although I don't know that for certain. Whether the, okay. whether the Sonys and the Canons and the Nikons do, I don't know. But that's, that's something that you could use. Uh, again, it's learning how to do it. And... Going back to what I said earlier, a great resource for learning how to do things like this is YouTube, because there's someone there who will be happy to show you how to do it. Yeah, we've actually got uh, Roger Hans talking next month, uh, both about things like that, uh, um, focus stacking and in flight. But he also, I think, is going to, a bit like you, advocate the use of YouTube as a resource. So if anyone yeah. wants to know more, um, you know, come back. I think it's the 22nd of April we have a, a talk, the last one, I think, before the summer break. Um, there's a question about, do you get black veined white in UK? Well, I know there's a big story about introducing <laughs> the black veined yeah. white. I don't know whether you know that one, Trevor. I, I think I do, and if it's the same story that you're talking about. Yes, yeah. black veined whites went extinct in, in Great Britain. And um, our very famous Winston Churchill, I believe, <laughs> Uh, wanted very much to bring it back and uh, brought a lot of possibly eggs and uh, and caterpillars to it. Was it Chart Well in Kent where he? Blenheim. Oh, I don't, it might have been. I thought it was Blenheim. Was it Blenheim? Okay, I, I can't remember. But anyway, he, he bought a lot of them back and uh, they put them all on a food plant, but unfortunately the gardener killed it or he killed or he, he cut it down or whatever. And so, I mean, you wouldn't dream of doing that today. I don't think butterfly conservation would be too happy about you bringing a whole load of uh, black vein whites back. Uh, but they never, they never reintroduced. I don't think there's any reason today why they wouldn't be able to do that. I think the conditions are right for them to be here. Uh, and I suppose one day they may return. I don't know. Okay. Somebody's asked if you use uh, a man-made background at all for your close-ups in the garden, your moths and things. I've, I've got a large board, which I've painted green. And from time to time, I do use that as a background, particularly with moth photography, you know, photography, because uh, I, want, I want a decent background for my moths. Uh, oh. But I don't have one that I carry with me, no. If I'm out in the field, I, I just take what's there. Okay, somebody's asking about uh, Raynox close-up filters for macro photography. I'm, I don't know whether you use them. I certainly have. I've used close-up filters in the past. In fact, even though I had all Nikon equipment, Canon, I've probably still got it, actually. Canon used to make a very good close-up filter that you could put on. 
I used it a few times, but I found it didn't give me the results that I really wanted, and so I stopped using it. But it is a possibility, you know, if you haven't got a macro lens, uh, you could, I mean, when I bought the Canon close-up, I think it was about 90 pounds, but that's been years and years ago. Um, it's, it's possibly a cheap way of getting macro without actually buying a macro lens. I mean, there are other things you can do, which I'm sure my good friend John could tell you a lot about, reversing lenses and things like that, which would produce work in macro, but I've, I've not gone into it now. Uh -huh. Um, somebody's asked if you've used a ring flash for the frame with the high aperture number. I haven't. I haven't. I have got flash. I mean, I've, I've got uh, the little flash that I fitted yeah. onto the uh, Olympus to take the gecko. But I've also got what is known in the trade as a butterfly flash, which is a flash on either side of the lens. Uh, and, and it will take decent it's not a ring flash but you've got a flash on either side of the lens it'll i don't use it very often because i find i don't need to it's there if i wanted but i don't very often carry it with me um i think it would be very useful if i was trying to do the kind of work that we mentioned just now trying to do butterflies in flight that might add a little bit of assistance in doing so but i've not done that up to now and if somebody um, says that um, I was asking actually if you when you do your camera in camera stacking on the Olympus, do you focus halfway down the subject as Olympus recommends? So <laughs> I don't quite know. That, so. uh, I wouldn't say I do actually. I I, I, foc I focus really on the point that's that's nearest for me to want to photograph on, which will be the subject, uh, and. It's it's really you've got to take every case at its merits. Sometimes you're going to have to photograph. It depends where the legs are or how the wings are. There's a lot of different things to take into account. But when you press the shutter, the camera will first of all align itself in front of where your focal point is, and then it will take it where your focal point is, and then it will go beyond that and start taking very small slices beyond your focal point so on that basis you need to put your focal point where you think it's going to be most effective and a little bit of practice you can soon work it out i when i first got the olympus and i struggled to understand it i got some little setups which i put on my table uh doing some tabletop work and and i did a lot of experimental work with um uh sheets of paper with marks on and things like that so that I could get a good feel of what it would do and what it wouldn't do and what I needed to do. And I think that's a good tip, actually. If you get new gear or if you get gear and you, you're trying to do something different, have a go at home. You know what the lighting's like. You know you've, you've got your setup. And if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. Just go back and repeat it. And you'll learn how to do it from doing it at home before you get out into the wide blue yonder. And then when you get into a situation, you say, oh, what do I do now? You should know because you've practiced it at home. So I think a couple of people have asked about what how you deal um, with insects that move during your ex, uh, exposure if you're going to do focus stacking. And somebody else asked about, you know, the antennae very rarely stay still. Is it still possible, I guess, to focus stack? How often do you, do you get success if it's moving? Well, if, it, if it's moving, you're not going to get a successful stack. There are, there are a couple of things that can happen. If it moves while you're stacking, you may be able from the stack to get enough images. You'd have to do this in Photoshop. Obviously, you couldn't do it in camera. You may be able to get enough images to produce you a good stacked image. The likelihood is, though, that it wouldn't work. If the subject moves while you're stacking, there's a possibility that you're going to get blurred images. And then that's a bin job. Uh, which is one of the reasons I think why I really like to photograph in the early morning and the evening when when insects are still, they don't move. Uh, they go to sleep like we do. And it's in the evenings, you can find them they're very still. And as long as you're careful and you don't disturb them, there's every good chance that you could make a good stack uh, and without the without anything moving. Of course, your biggest enemy, if you're out in the field, is wind. And where I live here on the coast, it's a coastal curse. Uh, we we get 
we get gales here, of course, but we it is generally windy here on the coast, and so stacking, uh, you, you've got you've got to you've got to adjust for the circumstances. Uh, if you're trying to photograph and stack in wind, you're going to have a hard time. It's not you you you'll have more failures than successes. So it's not the it's not the panacea. It's not the be all and the end all. There are times when a single shot is all you're going to be able to get. Mm. Uh, D Daniel uh, says he's got a comment about taking insects in flight. So whether you want to unmute yourself, yes, he has. Yeah. Go ahead, um, Danny. Yeah. Um, Trevor very kindly gave me some advice when I was, uh, I used to use a full frame Pentax and a big, fat, long, bit, huge uh, zoom on it. But I ended up with a medical problem where I had it go to something lighter. So I was looking at an Olympus and the latest Olympus, the OM-1, has got the capability to choose a subject to focus on. So you can choose a subject. One of the things that it allows you to choose is birds. And while I was out trying to photograph a dragonfly flying above a lake, I suddenly thought it's got moving wings and a body and eyes. So I switched the camera onto automatic uh, auto focusing on a bird setting, and it actually picked up the flying dragonfly. And since then, I've tried it on several other insects. And this isn't in any of the books or YouTube things that I've seen. So you might want to try that if your camera, I know the Olympus ones have, and if the camera has. Um, subject focus on birds, it may well pick up insects for you. Yeah, uh, we actually have a comment from Robert Singleton who says exactly the same. He's got an OM1 and bird detection right. works on dragonflies and is good for dragonflies in flight. So yep. there we are. Okay. Well I'm I'm seriously thinking uh about getting an OM1. I've got these I've got two OMDs which do all that I want to do really but you know what it's like when you're in photography. The next generation is always better than the one you've got. Uh, so I'm I'm debating whether or not I'm going to get one. I think I might eventually. I will. But just before you any more questions, Anne, I I just want to refer to something, and, I, and I'm not advertising here. I want you to understand that the trip that I went on to Bulgaria last year was superb. We were in the middle of nowhere. We were really in in a very rural part on the Greek border. It's going to run again this year. Uh, and I would like to go again, but at the moment, I don't think they've got it. They, they want a maximum of six, and I don't think they've got it. So if anybody would like to go on something like that to do the kind of work that we were doing last year, have a look on Green Wings. Uh, and if you need any more information, by all means, get in, get in touch with me, because I'd like to go, and I'd like to have enough people on it so that I can go. If it doesn't run, of course, I can't, because I'd really love to go again. It was good. Thanks, Anne. That's all right. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's always good to hear recommendation of some when you've actually been on something. Um, I, th th there's just a few more comments. I'm sure people are wanting to get off and get their tea and all the other things, watch the rugby or the football <laughs> that we sort of clashed with. Uh, somebody has just uh, somebody asked about whether a Raynox. It, it's a sort of um, very high quality clip on macro lens. And so somebody was asking about it and someone else has said they use it and it's excellent. And I actually use one um, on a, a, a small camera and it's excellent for macro. Um, yeah. uh, but somebody else asked, do you ever use extension tubes the other way? Of I do. Yes. From time to time, I do. When, when I feel the need to use one, I, I've got a, um, a, a set of extension tubes which I carry. When I go abroad, I carry them and sometimes I, I use them at home. But I don't use them very often. No. And do you ever use a focus focusing ray or now? No, I don't. I know people do. I've got focusing rails. I've got a very expensive one which was made by Minolta all those years ago. Uh, and if if I wanted to do a different form of stacking, you know, if I wanted to stack a hundred images or something like that, it's got a micrometer on it, so I could I could use it. But I, I haven't used it for a long time. I mean, it, people do use them and, and they are useful, but I haven't used one for a long time. Somebody asked about uh, the, the biggest uh, enemy being wind. Do you manage, do you ever photograph? Do you have any tips for photographing if it is windy? Or just give uh, up? <laughs> well, again, it, it's, it's very, you, you've got to take what you get. I mean, here on the coast, and I've, I've led 
to us into the dunes here when we have had the coastal curse and it's been windy. But you can always find somewhere sheltered. Well, not always, but a lot of the time, unless it's blowing a howling gale, you can usually find some location where you can achieve some shelter. And from time to time, you can shelter your subject. You know, you've, you've got a camera bag, put that uh, in a location where it's going to take the wind off the subject. There are things that you can do, may not always be perfect, but it isn't a perfect world. Sometimes we've got to adjust dependent upon what we get. Okay, well, I think um, we've just about got to the our apologies if I have missed anyone off, but it's a huge uh, chat with lots of people saying how wonderful the talk is, uh, as well as the uh, questions in the middle. So um, I think I'm going to call a halt to it and just say a very big thank you to Trevor. I think it's obvious from the questions and the way people have joined in that uh, they've really appreciated uh, your honesty, really, with sharing your tips and what are good things uh, and just giving people um, an opportunity to think about the subject. All we need now is insects and warm weather and some insects and we can get on with it. So thank you very much, Trevor, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye for everybody.